to see all of you and share these interventions that I've created called Groundbreaking Interventions. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about myself, um, I have a private practice in West LA. Uh, I specialize in adoption and foster care. However, I work with all issues dealing with trauma, so also children with their biological families who have um, experienced any traumatic events, divorce, domestic violence issues as well. And the interventions that I'm going to show you today, you can use pretty much with the whole spectrum of a child's experience. So dealing with trauma, grief and loss, and issues of anger and stress, which is really the primary emotion that's going on in all of this, is this post-traumatic stress. Uh, and teaching children really how to gain control and manage these feelings that can be so overwhelming and intense for them. Um, I developed these. Uh, it inspired me to create interventions because I found as a psychotherapist working with kids, I'm learning all about theory, but what do I do? What do I do? How do I apply what I'm learning in a directive way so I'm tackling issues with children and really working on these core issues and also make it non-threatening, creating that safety in the room with the client and taking the shame out of therapy, which is really two very important goals that I wanted to create around these interventions. Safety, making it fun, and also directing these, targeting these symptoms that we see on a daily basis with these children. So I'm excited to share with you uh, these interventions and I hope you enjoy. Uh, how many people, I'm just wanna, I'm curious, show of hands, have been to a training of mine before? Okay, okay, um, great. So you've seen my work, you've seen me perform, so to speak, <laughs> and uh, I hope that what I share with you today, I may be doing some similar interventions. I have 30 interventions, by the way, in a manual that I um, have with me if anyone's interested in purchasing them. There are 30 interventions, just like you see in your handout. So I'm showing you eight today, there's 22 more in here. And I break it down as to what you're working on, anxiety, fear, anger, aggressivity, impulse control, grief, loss. So you have some really targeted uh, issues to deal with, and then you'll be able to pull out an intervention and use it. So if you're interested, you can, they're over here for purchase. Um, so let's begin with the first intervention, and that's Belief Tower. So turn to page one of your handout. <laughs> And we shall begin. Okay. The Leaf Tower, as you can see, I broke it down. Now, how many people, as a psychotherapist, do you do Medi Cal? Medi Cal paperwork? Okay. Well, I've catered this paperwork here so you can write in exactly what symptoms you're working on, what you're reducing, so it's clear. Because I do Medi Cal too, and I, I'm one of the few as a psychotherapist who takes Medi Cal in private practice because I feel like it's important that these kids um, get uh, have a professional who knows the issues, and it's a lot of work, I know, but it's important, and I wanna stay connected with this population, foster care, so that's my passion. So as you can see, I've written it for Medi-Cal paperwork. So age range for this is seven to 13, and the goal is to get the child to believe in their abilities, build self-esteem, and take risks. So this can be done individual, on an individual one-on-one -on -one contact or in family. Now I can imagine I have some social workers here today too. Any social workers? Okay. <coughs> now I may be talking psychotherapy, but you can apply it in a social work setting where you meet the child for your visit and do a small intervention like this. So it can be ap applicable for social workers as well on your visit. Um, because this tool is actually can be an assessment tool. The belief tower is really um, working with a child to find out and discover what their talents are, what their weaknesses are, what their strengths are, and discover that with the child and also let the child know what those are. Because as you know, dealing with this population, there is a lot of low self-esteem. They don't really know that they have, that they're worthy, that they have value. So they do need to hear it over and over and over. 
And one of the things I say to people is you're not going to create a narcissist, narcissist personality with this population. They cannot hear it enough that I'm worth it, that I'm valuable, that I have these talents. So if you are working with a child and you don't see a talent, I encourage you to really draw that out and provide that child with resources so that they can expand on that talent because that's really important. And I think for a lot of these kids that have gone through the system, knowing that they do have something to offer, to give and provide, it gives them a sense of belonging in the world, that I have something to offer, that I am important, that I am of value. Um, so I encourage you to see if you see any talents within a child to really encourage and draw and bring it out for them. Um, so let's begin. So this intervention, you get a pack of uh, cups, and I prefer yellow, blue, and red. Now the colors I use in my office, I use the four feelings. Okay, and let me go back because there's two primary emotions. I'm of the belief system of the stress model. I don't know if anyone's heard of the stress model by Beyond Consequences. I highly recommend you go to their website, beyondconsequences.com and purchase the book Beyond Consequences, Logic and Control, which talks about the stress model involved with these children. Um, the stress model talks about that there are two primary emotions, love and fear. And so on top of that, that's the core issue, that we're always dealing with those two core primary emotions. We don't have, first we have an emotion, and it comes from the body, and then it goes to the mind. CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, would say you have the thought first. But in this stress model, dealing with post-traumatic stress, the new research coming out is that children have an emotion in their body, then they have a thought process about that emotion, and then they act it out. And that's with feelings. And I'm just clarifying this, because what I teach kids is there are four basic feelings. Mad, scared, glad, or sad. Okay, so, and this is what I do in my office, just to simplify, because it can be really complicated for these kids to grasp all of this, and I'm giving them a language of their emotional life, which I think is very, very important. So, glad is happy, red is mad, blue is sad, and then scared would be purple. This, I use these three primary, these three feelings, happy, mad, and sad. So I begin by telling them we're going to make a tower, a belief tower. And a, a big part of this too is you're going to notice my affect. And one of the things I always tell clinicians and when you're doing these interventions, if you're not excited, the child will not be excited. So you have to present it in a way and entice them that this is going to be so much fun and we're going to do this together. And I'm here with you, and I'm not giving up, and I'm staying connected, and I value you. So encouraging them to do this and enticing them in a way. And one of the things that I do is I always keep a very, dealing with children who've had trauma, 90% of our communication is nonverbal. Okay? Very, very important to understand working with this population. So your nonverbal. You have to be very aware of your nonverbal cues. So I will train parents and therapists to go to the mirror and open your face and really notice how you're asking a question because we may, come up, we may think in our own perception we're asking a question and we're being empathic, but what the child's seeing and what they're experiencing in their perception is something different. Because they have a perception and we have a perception. But we need to be aware of our perceptions. And the child, so if we're asking a question like, oh, so tell me, you know, tell me more about that picture. My face is saying one thing. My voice may be saying another, but my face is saying something else. And what they're seeing is possibly, and this is just in their perception, I'm accusatory, I'm judgmental, especially if they've had abuse or trauma, physical, emotional abuse, where if they see mommy or daddy doing this, uh-oh, that triggers something, 
something not safe is going to happen, and it's going to trigger that child's stress.